Norfolk. Uh, on the 12th of March, I interviewed a specialist in disaster response, Dr. Roger Abbott from the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion based in Cambridge. In view of the urgency of the COVID-19 epidemic, I just put up some excerpts from that conversation so that people could at least be encouraged and inspired. And I promised that I would put up this full interview, which is what now follows. And it's hopefully something other than the rather dismal news that we're watching us and helps to educate ourselves in the midst of this pandemic. Hopefully it will be reassuring uh, to people to listen to this and to educate ourselves as to what we can do in our lockdown situation now to be a source of encouragement and resilience. In fact, I found it very helpful listening again to Roger's voice and his calming influence and hopefully we can take some of the lessons that he's learned from his experience to fortify us. I have some thoughts and comments in the light of my conversation with Roger, particularly on the question of those of us who are committed members of a faith community and how we need to respond in love and compassion in this unparalleled emergency. But I'll hold those until the end. I will also explain what I plan to do to hopefully encourage folk to be more resilient. I have plans for interviews with a number of other people who are specialists in their field, yeah. psychologists, other doctors who have all agreed to come and actually allow me to pick their brains as, as I've done a little bit with Roger. Um, so I ask you folk to give comments on the comment section as to questions which you might have. I want to thank up front again Roger and Professor Bob White from the Faraday Institute of Science and Religion for having made time two weeks ago to share what they are all about. Before we turn to the interview, let me just say this. It has never been more important for good science on the one hand and good religion on the other to now wash each other's hands with lots of soap and warm water. Well, welcome now into another episode of My Caring Conversations. This one has happened very much on the fly, somewhat spontaneously, because just this morning I was privileged to meet somebody who I had never met before, who seemed to have such a fascinating story to tell in terms of his own life as a theologian, as a pastor, and who has, in the latter part of his career now, worked very much on response to natural disasters. He did his PhD in practical theology in how to help in the, Euro in the UK context uh, in situations of emergency and crisis. So, uh, Roger, have I got that more or less right? Yes, yes indeed. Um, 30 years in pastoral ministry um, and you can't be in pastoral ministry for too long before you uh, are hitting crises of various kinds. Uh, whether it's illness, whether it's uh, bereavement, whether it's dying, um, or just struggling with life. Um, so I was 30 years doing that, basically, uh, in church work in the East Midlands. And then at uh, halfway through that, uh, round about 1989, um, I was faced with a with a really critical incident in that there was a, a serious aircraft disaster. Actually, the plane landed on the motorway near, near to us, and I was asked to respond to that. And I was involved in that, particularly with, with those who had been bereaved, uh, but also with those who had survived. And that challenged my faith. Uh, as a Christian, um, it challenged it not in the sense that it uh, it made me give up on my faith or, or or it made me doubt my faith, but it yeah it presented challenges, particularly the issue of suffering and uh, and bereavement. So I'd always wanted from then on to do a PhD to have the research opportunity of exploring how this had affected my faith or how my faith had uh, been influenced by the work that I had done there. But it wasn't until 2006 that I had the opportunity to do that in a full-time capacity. So I came out of the pastoral ministry and applied myself to this, uh, this PhD 
using the discipline of practical theology, which seemed the most appropriate discipline to do the kind of examination that I wanted to do. And uh, it was after I completed my PhD that the post at the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion, based in Cambridge in the United Kingdom, came up, uh, working with Professor uh, Bob White, and that was to specialise in the field of so-called natural disasters, which uh, would take me around the world uh, to uh, focus upon three of the most catastrophic disasters in modern times, in Haiti, in New Orleans, and, and in the Philippines. Mm. So that's how I arrived at where I am. Roger, you said so-called natural disaster. Why that qualification? <laughs> the work I did for my PhD, which was based on my experience of uh, an aircraft disaster. Now, the disasters that we experience in the United Kingdom, apart from flooding, are all, you could say, pretty obviously human. They're, they're um, mechanical or sport re event related, uh, aircraft, railway, maritime disasters. Those things that are commonly referred to as natural disasters tend to be those associated with natural hazards, as the uh, geographers refer to them. Earthquakes, volcanoes, floods, landslides, uh, hurricanes, those kinds of things. So the first disaster that I uh, focused upon was that following an earthquake in, in Haiti and then a hurricane in, in, in uh, Hurricane Katrina uh, in, in New Orleans and the super typhoon Yolanda in uh, the Philippine Isles. Now, all of those are natural hazards. They are natural events, they are features of the natural world mm. that are absolutely necessary, actually, to the flourishing of our, of our planet. Mm. Without them, the planet would be sterile and uh, human life would be, would be impossible. So they are necessary. And therefore, in, in one sense, there's nothing wrong with them. Mm. Uh, we need them. Mm. It's when humans begin to interact with them that the real problems arise. And it's, my research has shown uh, that it's human factors that turn natural hazards into disasters. Mm -hmm. They are not natural they are human. So in social work, they used to define a crisis as an upset in the steady state. Mm -hmm. And that for social workers to make interventions that were constructive, you almost needed a crisis. Because sometimes people get complacent in their, in their groove. So say something about what your experiences have been. You have biomedical knowledge, which is important. Social workers then deal with the psychosocial but it seems to me that your interest has been in a more spiritual dimension of those mm. and what role that plays uh, in either enhancing or diminishing the resilience of a crisis-affected community to respond. Absolutely. Um, the, the, the purpose or the focus of my research in particular, was to explore the religious beliefs of survivors of these catastrophic events and to see how those beliefs influenced the way uh, those survivors um, interpreted or understood the uh, events, how they responded to them, how they recovered from them, and then also very importantly, how those beliefs influenced, again, as you say, positively or negatively, how they influenced ways in which they would look to mitigate or to, to diminish the impact of the natural hazard upon them 
uh, in the future. Mm. Mitigation being uh, very crucial mm. to living with mm. natural hazards. Mm. It's possible to live with natural hazards and not die from them. Is there a silver bullet? <laughs> no, I, I mean, it would be naive to say that there is a silver bullet. I think the, the, the overall lesson from a pastoral or theological uh, uh, approach is to learn the wisdom to know how to, to live with these hazards which are created by God. And uh, if, if, we, if we lose that relationship with God, which I believe uh, human beings were created to have, if we lose that, then we lose that wisdom and uh, we, we take on a wisdom of our own, if you like, which can at times be very self-centered, very materialistic, very greedy, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, and it's when we do that that we lose, we lose control, if you like, of how, how to live mm -hmm. uh, safely with natural hazards. And that's when... Um, that's when we become very vulnerable to them. And the way that plays out is not so much in an individual sense, although that is important, but it plays out systemically and structurally. And by that I mean the poor and those who are disenfranchised, those who live mainly in low-income countries. And they are the most vulnerable to natural hazards, but because of their social status, they are the ones who have least assets, who have least resources to acquire that resilience, if you like, that you speak of, and they are the ones who, who suffer most. And one of the reasons that they are denied those assets and denied those resources is because of poverty. Um, Whereas those who live in more high-income countries mm. tend, first of all, not to experience the hazards mm. to the same degree. But even if they do, they have the resources and the assets to protect them. Mm. So there is a socio-economic, mm. and I would say an issue of great social injustice, actually, which uh, we can easily ignore when it comes to how we consider responding to, uh, to disasters. It corresponds again in my experience working as a social worker with the most vulnerable and disadvantaged, and it's not virtue signalling by saying that. That's my job. Sure. And the paradox of it is that I live in Johannesburg in a relative affluence uh, and have been well-educated, got all sorts of resources, in some ways, in my work with vulnerable, disadvantaged people, they humanise me because the only resource they do have is their solidarity, their compassion. Brené Brown, who has had a big influence in my life, a social worker and author, makes the point that we actually are hardwired for altruism as human beings. Mm -hmm. That is our deeper essential nature. And if we can use theological terminology, we are created in the image of a God who we believe to be good. So there is yeah. inherent within us that desire to love and to share and compare. However, when we become more developed and sophisticated, and some people would say spoiled, mm. we lose touch with that. It seems to me that the big opportunity of the so-called natural disasters we are facing is that it's a chance for us to, in a sense, wake up, to come to a deeper knowledge, when I say us, people of my demographic, to actually realise that life is more than just, you know, watching endless films on Netflix or doing these things. It's, it is about community, it is about humanity, and that it's not just being ascetic and sacrificial about it, it's actually in our interests. Yeah. So let's embrace these disastrous situations as an opportunity to learn. Does that correspond? Yeah, I mean, it, it resonates a lot with my, my own experience, my own belief. Uh, obviously, one doesn't wish disasters to happen so that we can uh, engage with these things. It would be lovely if we, if we engaged with these things without disasters. The disaster, if you like, 
heightens and, and enhances, if you like, the opportunity. Uh, it, they certainly concentrate the mind, of course they do. Mm. When I went to Haiti, both as a responder for the earthquake and cholera, and then as a researcher, um, one of the things that really drew me to this research and drew me back to the Haitian people was um, the sense of community and belonging that they seem to have, particularly in the rural areas. In, in, in the city, it was still there, but not as strong as in the rural areas. Um, they have this feature in Haiti they call the Laku, mm -hmm. which is Creole. In Haitian Creole, Israel really means space, open space. And when you go into the communities, you find houses um, built around a space, a circle or a square, and... Um, and everybody's in and out of each other's homes. They eat together, they cook together, and, uh, and they help one another. They are a huge communal support system, mm. informal, but very natural and very, very, very powerful. Mm. And they can actually also be a huge <laughs> a sense of justice to each other. Haitians often have their own way of administering justice, mm. some of it we wouldn't want to indulge in. Others, it can be very effective. And, uh, and we just don't have that. You have it here, I think, in South Africa, and certainly in, in Zimbabwe, with the Ubuntu. My purpose is, is, is for you. Mm. Whereas here in the, in the United Kingdom, in my home, life is very individualistic, very mm. private. An Englishman's home is his castle. And we're very good at that. We can bring up the drawbridge mm. and keep people away because we enjoy our privacy. In Haiti, you can't do that. There's very few locked doors. Mm. There are very few, you know, compound walls to keep mm. people out. It's a very inviting sense mm. of community. If you're, if you're going to be part of us, you need to be part of us. Mm. So when an earthquake strikes and the vulnerability of infrastructure, of housing and buildings is severely tested. Um, and you don't have that immediate response from um, health care, mm. from engineers uh, that we would have here in the West. Then the one thing you do have is people. Mm. The most effective, and it didn't really come out in the media, the most effective, life-saving response to the Haitian earthquake was not the influx of uh, relief workers from, the, from, from outside the international community. It was actually the people who lived there. They were the first ones to be digging people out from underneath the rubble of destroyed buildings. They were the ones that were comforting the injured. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that were turning out mm -hmm. to, as nurses and as doctors. That's something which was, I think is mm -hmm. underestimated, underpublished, underrecognized mm -hmm. in the media, mm -hmm. but it is incredibly powerful um, in, 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 the, in the Haitian community. Mm -hmm. This morning I asked you to respond to a brief story I told and unfortunately all my mates were <laughs> wanting your time. So let me quickly tell that story again uh, because I really, it was a big life lesson for me is when after the Asian tsunami um, I had been working for the World Health Organization in Africa and uh, in other respects in HIV AIDS and, and food insecurity but then the tsunami struck. Hmm. And there was that wave traveled right across the Indian Ocean and it also impacted on Somalia hmm. and Kenya and others. And I found myself in Somalia as one of the, certainly not the first responders. It took a while to get there. Sure. And I saw exactly what you described. After the tsunami, we had a post tsunami conference and lessons learned in Phuket. And I went there to <laughs> represent Africa. Oh, right. <laughs> Someone grand as, as white male from South Africa representing Africa. There were 150 or so people killed in Somalia by yeah. it, which just shows the magnitude of the wave. Yeah. But the, the story that I, would, I was sharing this morning, which I found 
really instructive was shared by an NGO worker from um, the state of Tamil Nadu in India, who, who amongst all, of, all these doctors with the you know, multiple degrees and all these specialists, mm -hmm. I just found her story the most compelling because she told us that she was a wife of a, of a pastor in the community mm -hmm. and in talking with her and, and discussing it, we, we, we came to that same sense that in the context of vulnerability and look, let's face it, the planet is in a very growingly unstable situation. Yeah. Um, the best thing we can be doing is to somehow continue to redouble our efforts in education of support, of working, of creating cross-pollinating of stories so that those of us who are in our relative privilege in the northern suburbs of Johannesburg are more ready to cope with a disaster thanks to lessons learned from people who are living in those marginal positions. I think what we've learned is that there is huge generational wisdom um, and going back through the generations of these people who, who, who live in these vulnerable communities, that very often what they experience have been experienced perhaps many generations before. An accumulation of wisdom has built up. That can influence how people respond to these with great wisdom. Um, whether it's, as you say, in the case of, of, of this lady, and presumably she was well out of the way of the wave, so there is great wisdom in her being able to say, well, let's, let's, take, a, let's take a hard look at what's happened here. And then we, we're in a place to, to, to arrive at the best possible strategies and moves to, to, to take, most helpful moves to take. The point you make, I think, about education is, is, is very important. I mean, we, we heard in our, in, a, in our conversation and discussion this morning that uh, Professor White made mention of that island community, Simalu, this, this island, a little island off Banda Aceh in Indonesia in the Indian Ocean. And um, it was assumed that all on this uh, little island must have perished. And it was some time before rescue workers could get to the island. But, but when they arrived there, in fact, they found that these people were still alive and well. Mm. And when they inquired into this, they, they learned that uh, generational learning had told them, had, had led them to believe that when they see the signs of the tsunami, and, and thank the Lord there are signs of an encroaching tsunami, and the, the most obvious one is when the, the sea, the tide goes out, mm. and goes out much farther than is, would be normal, even leaving fish floundering on, mm. on, on the dry sand, uh, that when they see these signs then they head for the high ground. And that is precisely what they had done. And so they had all lived. And it reminded me, uh, as I was listening to this, of an account I heard actually of a, a British family who were on holiday in Phuket in Thailand when the tsunami struck. And it, it centred around the experience of a, a little 12-year-old girl who was on the beach with her mum and dad and with her brother. And uh, it was a beautiful sunny day, as we know, on Boxing Day. And uh, her father said he was going to go back to, uh, to, to their accommodation. And um, so she was on the beach with, with her mother. I think the son had returned as well. And suddenly she saw this phenomenon of the, of the tide going out. And she became very concerned. And she said to her mum, we really need to get off this beach. We need to do that quickly. And initially her mother said, well, thought the child was, you know, just being overdramatic, if you like, a drama queen and saying, you know, come on now. Mm -hmm. But she said, no, mum, we need to get off. And so eventually her mother relented and, and, and they did get off. And they were also instrumental in alerting the, the, the lifeguards who cleared the beach. Mm. And as a result of that, over a hundred people 
were saved. Um, now, why did that happen? Because this little girl had been in att attending a school in, 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 in England, and she, she put the... She was regarded as a bit of a heroine, you see, but she said, no, the real hero is my geography teacher who taught us all about tsunamis. Mm -hmm. And had he not done that, she and her family would well have perished. Mm -hmm. um, but because he had, she was able to apply that learning, see the signs, and evacuate the beach. Mm -hmm. So we learned the extraordinary power and value mm -hmm. of good education about natural hazards. Mm -hmm. We need to know about them. They are dangerous. Mm -hmm. It's a dangerous creation. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's, it needs to kill or it needs to disable or harm. Mm -hmm. uh, we just need to learn how to live with it. And education is a vitally important part mm -hmm. of that. Let's, let's bring that into the reality of today where we see a lot of anxiety and fear <laughs> because of the spread of the coronavirus. What lessons can we take from past experience and your reflections? Just to go back my, to my experience in Haiti when I first arrived with the, the cholera epidemic at, it, at, its, at its height at that mm. time. And these people had never had cholera in their country for a hundred years, if not more. So there wasn't the generational experience of living with cholera, uh, this disease that can kill you within three hours if you don't get the basic medical attention. And there was a huge amount of fear, you can imagine. Uh, there was no or very little clinical understanding of the, of the disease. Uh, and so when uh, the, um, the aid agencies came in, and particularly the medical aid agencies came in, with a very clear knowledge of the disease, of this particular uh, virus, um, initially they were met with hostility because of the fear. That is what fear does. It creates hostility mm. and it delays, actually, attention being given to the virus. Mm. Now, that's a big danger, I think, we are seeing at the moment with the coronavirus. I think there are two dangers. One is of uh, being too relaxed mm -hmm. and assuming that there, there is no problem. Mm -hmm. The other one is to go to the other extreme and panic. And, and fear, of course, tends to create panic. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the thing about the coronavirus is, again, we are or most of us, the general public, are very largely ignorant of what it is. Mm. We know it's, it has no vaccine, mm. uh, and that in itself can be very scary because we've come, become so used to vaccines and being sheltered from, uh, from disease by vaccines. At the moment, there is no vaccine. Uh, we don't know, if you like, how this disease will, will work in the individual. We know that for many people it will be a mild cold or a mild flu. We know that for some people there will be no symptoms, very few symptoms. But we know on the other hand, for some, it will be life-threatening mm. and some will die. And I think it's the uncertainty about the disease and even if we knew about the virus, the uncertainty about who of us it will affect, in what, way, in what way, that creates enormous fear. So here we have a situation, and this is what disease does like this. It creates uncertainty because we may become seriously ill or we may die. We don't know. And that really concentrates the mind. You can speak from your own personal experience about a shock, a health yeah. shock. So tell us a bit about your own experience. Well, thankfully, it wasn't. A, it, well, it was a disease. It was coronary heart disease. I've always been a fairly fit sort of guy. I've always been involved in sports of some kind or other, and certainly, even as a theologian, 
when you can become very inert if you're not careful, um, being careful to take requisite exercise and keep a healthy diet and so on. So I was doing all of that. Mm. I, I, since 1991, when I had a back injury, I'd been going down to the gym regularly, working out down there. But in the years from 2011, I think, uh, it, it began. I was down the gym and I began to experience less capacity to work. I was running out of fuel, if you like, or the carburetor just wasn't pushing the energy through. If I can tell a rather humorous story, which uh, tells you a little bit more about me, I was on my way to the gym one, one sunny day. I used to go down for the lunch break. And um, I was cycling, and uh, as I was cycling, I was overtaken by a postman on his bike. And uh, I took offence at this. <laughs> so I said, well, there's no way you're going to overtake me and not get overtaken again. So I went after him on my bike. Mm. And to my enormous pleasure, I overtook him. Yeah. But then I got a sensation in my neck, into my head, uh, a sort of a fainting coming on. And I, well, I've never had this before. I better slow down. The next thing I knew... I was waking up in the middle of the road with a lady shouting, screaming, we need an ambulance, we need an ambulance. So I, I looked up from the road and said, just, just give me a minute. And uh, I got up and I said, no, I'm OK, I'm OK. And uh, I got on my bike <laughs> and cycled on to my GP. The way this worked out is that I ended up going to hospital, being referred by the GP, and having tests which showed that I had uh, uh, an artery problem. So I had some more tests, and I remember my uh, after one particular one, I'd gone back to the hospital ward, and I remember the consultant coming around very quickly and explaining to me that they had found some issues within my heart uh, blocked arteries and so on and they, he said um, I really advise you have uh, open heart surgery a cardiac bypass graft and I don't want you to go home until we've done that because if something catastrophic happens you will die mm. that all happened within just a few hours mm. and I can honestly say this what amazed me was the sense of peace I had I mean, it was difficult to take it all in, as you can imagine, to begin with, but there was a huge sense of peace. And I remember ringing up my wife, who was fully expecting me to come home, and saying, listen, I'm afraid I have to stay in hospital because I have to have uh, open-heart surgery. So it probably affected my poor wife more than it did me, but I, I, I had this real sense of, of peace. I had a marvellous surgeon referred to me, who did a huge amount to answer my questions, to put my mind at rest as much as possible, but at the same time assuring me that this was serious, uh, this was major surgery, and then you get the anaesthetist coming around and you have to sign the disclaimer, as it were, that you could possibly die. And, uh, and he was great. He was a Hungarian, and, and he was great as well. Within four days, I was out of hospital and beginning the very excellent cardiac rehabilitation program that they have uh, in, in the hospital I was in, which actually was a center of excellence for, for cardiac surgery. So I'm hugely uh, thankful to the medical science that, that was going on at that time. Mm. And, uh, and embraced it mm. and benefited from it. Mm. And I'm here still to tell the story. But now, if I was your social worker, if you needed one, I would have probably, you know, counselled you and your wife to now take it easy, <laughs> you know, play more with your grandchildren, you know, you know, grow vegetables in your garden. But yet, that was the beginning of a whole new chapter in your life where you've been traveling around the world looking at helping people deal with unnatural disasters. 
Absolutely. I mean, that, that surgery took place in, in, in uh, February mm -hmm. of 2011. In um, May, I think it was, 2011, I was invited to interview by the Faraday Institute because a job position had come up there. I was awarded the job with the Faraday in, in, in June 2000 and, uh, 2012. Mm -hmm. in, uh, I started it in July. I was climbing the uh, mountains in the south of France in, in, in August and, and that was a, a huge experience of relief from pain and discomfort and mm. enjoying the glory of the, of, of the Maritime Alps. Mm. And then in December of that year I made my first visit, a scoping visit to Haiti just of 10 days, uh, plunged into the wall of heat that, that, that Haiti uh, represents. And then I went uh, to the Philippines in uh, January of 2014 because the super typhoon had, had swept mm -hmm. through uh, an island there that I wanted to, uh, to do the research on. And then, in, uh, no sooner had I come back from the Philippines in, in March 2014, I was out in Haiti again, this time for, for three months, mm -hmm. doing proper field work, uh, ethnographic field work in the communities, in the in the slums, in the city, mm. and up in the mountains, the beautiful mountains of Haiti. Mm. Uh, then I was back in Haiti again in 2014 for another three months. Mm. And, and so it went on. Uh, mm. in, in 2015, I was in New Orleans for three months. Mm. Uh, 2017, I was back in the Philippines and in New Orleans doing mm. research. So. It's been a huge experience going to some very beautiful places, very interesting places, meeting a lot of interesting cultures and people, but where, I'm afraid to say, horrible things had, uh, had happened. So it's been a real adventure. The Faraday Institute, what's that about? The Faraday Institute for Science and Religion uh, is based in Cambridge. It was founded in 2006 by Dr. Dennis Alexander, a biologist, and uh, Professor uh, Robert White, who is a geophysicist. Mm -hmm. And they had a concern to try and demonstrate how science and religion uh, are not in conflict. Mm -hmm. And they were deeply concerned to help young scientists in particular, who were men and women of faith, to realize that they could work comfortably within their discipline and not feel there was a great conflict going on between their personal faith and their calling, their desire to work as scientists. So they started the, the, the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion in St. Edmund's College, which was part of the university. It was important that they establish this research community within the University of Cambridge. Wow. And that's how it started in 2006, and then it developed uh, with taking on board researchers, doing research projects in, in a variety of things, in geoscience, in the environment, in genetics, in uh, artificial intelligence, in neurological aspects, for instance, of epilepsy, and the integration with, with religious experience, it would be true to say, uh, has stood its ground, gained enormous respect mm -hmm. within the, uh, the University of Cambridge. And then, uh, more latterly, it has become independent, but still, broadly speaking, within the, the umbrella, if you like, of the University of Cambridge, the wider umbrella of U University of Cambridge, and uh, still carries enormous respect within the scientific as well as in the uh, faith community. Mm. It loves, I love the interesting paradoxes and ironies because he's shattering all those stereotypes that we have that you know, normally we think of you know, academics and scientists from Cambridge and Oxford as being in their ivory towers and I just love the fact that they hired a practical theologian who's now spending his time going into looking at natural disasters. Yeah. And it reminds me of Eugene Peterson's comment, which I love. He says, if we divorce 
theology from geography, we get into nothing but trouble. That you yeah. cannot really get the fullest sense of what life and meaning is if, if one stays within our heads. We need to get into our hearts, we need mm -hmm. to engage with people in relationship building, and from that a, a richness comes. Well, of course, my particular role uh, is one I think I would enjoy, I enjoy in, in, in one sense, in terms of the work and the focus I have. And it's just a privilege to be in that role. I think we have to be careful about the stereotyping of the other kinds of research that goes on because if it, whether it's blue sky research or, or something very, uh, very practical, mm -hmm. there's still a huge amount that goes on within academia um, for, from which the public will benefit hugely, whether it's in medical science, whether it's in engineering, whether it's in genetics. So at times that kind of research may look as if it's a bit too much cerebral, but in actual fact it's the kind of science that needs to be done before the application can take place. For my part, my work requires me to go out into the field to, to talk to people, to listen to people, to get a feel, to understand their experience. But it also requires me to come back home within academia to reflect and to read the literature and to, yeah, to arrive at some safe conclusions. Uh, one of the things that Faraday does take very seriously is the public dissemination of its work. And we do that through our, our work with schools, that particularly focuses upon work with schools and with local churches. And in other ways, where it is possible, we do seek to influence public policy. I mean, that, that is something we would really love to, to, to be able to be more effective in, but it's certainly something that drives us to influence public policy uh, so that our research makes a difference to life and particularly to the struggles of life. Well, that was now a little more than two weeks ago. And since then, as we, anybody who's not aware of it, the world has gone into lockdown. This coronavirus is becoming ever more deadly and threatening and creating huge consternation both to people in terms of their physical health and to the global economy. It's a very uncertain future that we face and I think more than ever do we need people who exemplify the qualities what Roger has and who Martin Luther King Jr. some more than 50 years ago in one of his sermons said the need for us to have tough minds and tender hearts. There's no tension between science and faith. There's only a tension between tough-hearted scientists and tender-minded people of faith. A week after this interview, my friend Jonathan Shapiro posted this cartoon, which in the extraordinary gift that he has of being able to be very tough-minded, well, as I know him personally, he said he's a deeply compassionate guy, he cares. He plays his role as a court jester very well. And it shocked me, as it needed to, as somebody of faith, to see what a bishop in a Zionist church from KZN was planning to do in defiance of the science of what we know about the coronavirus. So in meditating and reflecting on it, a encouragement came my way from my friend Angela Quintel, who lives in New York now, in lockdown. Um, she posted on Facebook regular updates of her experience. She then said, John, why don't you make a series of videos or podcasts that you can upload to just help people from going mad whilst they're in lockdown? Mm -hmm. That led to a train of thought which is now going to result in what I'm going to be calling a 12-part series called Of Tough Minds and Tender Hearts. Wisdom from the midst of the coronavirus pandemic. I'm planning to get on camera through Zoom or Skype people that exemplify tough minds and tender hearts from around the world, friends that I have, to fortify all of us with wisdom 
on how we can be more resilient. So that's coming. If you want to get them, let me know. Subscribe to this channel. I'm planning 12 episodes because I think we're in for the long haul here. And there's obviously learning along the way and obviously that's very much part of what being a tough mind is that you embrace error. You don't sort of sit fast and stay within your conservative view of the world and think that nothing's going to change. We have to learn our way through this challenge. So hopefully that was what it will be. Because to go back to what Martin Luther King said, there is little hope for us until we become tough-minded enough to break loose from the shackles of prejudice, half-truths and downright ignorance. The shape of the world today does not permit us the luxury of soft-mindedness. A nation or a civilization that continues to produce soft-minded people purchases its own spiritual death on an installment plan.